So we'll start with the uh, cyst talk. And we're going to talk about breast cysts that aren't simple. People worry about them a lot. But in general, I think they worry too much because the vast majority are benign. So we're going to show a lot of beautiful histology from Laszlo and other places that show why cysts look the way they do and, and help you get a feeling for whether you should worry about a non-simple cyst or not. What I'm showing here is a, a nice large section pathology slide. And what I want to show is that I, I make it grayscale and video inverted so that white is black and black is white. You can see that it looks a lot like the ultrasound. And so when I show you the correlations, I'm going to use a lot of histologic uh, beautiful color pictures that I'm going to convert to grayscale and video invert so you understand why things look the way they do. I have no disclosures to make. Now, the percentage of cysts that is not simple is higher today than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Um, the reason for that is is a combination of us using scan parameters that exceed the ability of the machine to clean up the noise. We, we've pushed our frequency so high, our bandwidth so wide, and our dynamic range so wide that we're creating some haze inside the cyst. But secondly, with the higher frequency, we have better resolution, and we're seeing real proteinaceous and or fatty debris inside the cyst that creates echoes. So what is fibrocystic change? Well, I'm showing you a picture of a normal breast TDLU, terminal ductolobular unit. This is the lobule in the long axis, and this is the extra lobular terminal duct part. So it looks like a tennis racket. And this is a short axis view, which would be taken 90 degrees through that. Now, inside this asinus are 50 to 60 asini on average. In fibrocystic change, what happens is the asini become fluid distended. So I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven fluid distended or, or cystically dilated asini. And I see the extralobular terminal duct and the intralobular terminal duct in the center. And then the normally loose gray stromal tissue becomes abnormally white. That's the fibro part of fibrocystic change. As fibrocystic change gets worse, um, or more progressive, uh, the asini enlarge. The walls between some of the asini rupture or become effaced, so we have fewer larger microcysts. And then ultimately, if all the uh, walls between the asini rupture or efface, we come up with a simple unilocular cyst, which occurs because of twisting these are beautiful pictures from Laszlo. For some reason, they don't have Laszlo's name on there, but all of these are Laszlo large section, thick section um, slides. Uh, so we don't have any trouble with normal TDLUs. We don't have any trouble with uh, simple cysts. But these in-between states of microcysts can cause us problems because the microcysts can be too small to resolve. And if you volume average a white, micro, uh, white fibrous tissue, with black uh, microcysts, what you'd come up with is gray. So what I did here is a, I just put this in Photoshop and I did a Gaussian blur. So this is this image blurred. And you can see that with lower resolution, I can't resolve the microcysts. And this looks like a solid mural nodule, an isochoic solid mural nodule. And in this case, I blur, you can see that it looks like there's a thick septation. So what I found is that with lower end, cheaper ultrasound, machines, you can't resolve the microcysts as well. So I don't think you miss cancers more, but you have less ability with a lower end ultrasound machine that has lesser resolution. You have less ability to resolve the microcysts, which are benign, and come up with a falsely suspicious appearance of a complex cystic and solid mass with either a mural nodule or a thick septation. Now, fibrocystic change is not just cystic change but it usually includes a mixture of benign proliferative disorders like usual duct hyperplasia, apricot metaplasia, fibrosclerosis, whatnot. So if we go down the primarily cystic pathway, it's easier to call things benign. If we, if we take the bottom pathway where there's more benign proliferative things, it's harder to call something benign. We, we come up with more false positives. And again, it, it's usually a matter of the microcysts are too small to resolve in some cases. In other cases, they're larger and more easily to resolve. So what makes this difference? 
Well, in general, it has to do with estrogen receptors. Okay, so this is a single TDLU, and this is an estrogen stain, the black. And so we can see that the asini that have estrogen receptors become cystically dilated, while those that lack the estrogen receptors don't cystically dilate. And so we can get heterogeneous TDLUs in which some of the asini are cystically dilated enough for us to recognize as cysts, but others, others do not. And what can happen in these cases, and again, these are beautiful Laszlo 3D pictures, uh, we can resolve some of the mi cysts that are large enough, the microcysts that are large enough, but the ones that are too small can make it look like a complex cystic and solid mass. So one of the reasons that benign fibrocystic change can look suspicious is uneven distribution of estrogen receptors. And the suspicious part is the part that doesn't have the estrogen receptors. Now, when the fluid has a relatively low amount of proteinaceous or fatty debris, they can appear simple cystic. So these are clustered simple cystic microcysts. But there are several reasons that we can get echoes inside the microcysts. One of these is that the fluid can be echogenic due to a high concentration of proteinaceous debris and or fatty debris. Another reason is that what creates the fluid is papillary apricot metaplasia or apricot metaplasia. So if you have papillary apricot metaplasia filling microcysts, that can make them appear echogenic. And then I, on the previous slide, I talked about uneven estrogen receptors. So the part that doesn't have estrogen receptors can appear to be solid. And the fourth reason is micropapillary carcinoma in situ. In my experience, uh, about 99, more than 99% of all these complex microcystic things are caused by echogenic fluid, papillary acromedoplasia, or uneven estrogen receptors, and less than 1% are caused by micropapillary carcinoma in situ. So that should be reassuring. Now, in the ACR by results on lexicon, complicated has one connotation, and it needs to be distinguished from complex. And in fact, in, in the last version of Bioreds in 2013, edition 5, we took away the word complex and we made it complex, cystic, and solid. Because people, frankly, couldn't remember whether complicated or complex was worse. And by changing the terminology to complex, cystic, and solid, it makes it easier to appreciate that that's a, more, that's a higher risk situation. So complicated breast cysts are usually Bioreds 2 or 3. If they're multiple incidental, bilateral, they're bioreds too. If there's a dominant complicated cyst that causes a palpable abnormality or um, a mammographic abnormality, you might call it bioreds 3. What makes it complicated? Echogenic fluid or echogenic debris within the fluid. So diffuse low-level echoes within the cyst fluid. Scintillating echoes, which are mobile cholesterol crystals. We'll talk more about that later. Debris levels created by proteaceous debris layering out on the dependent part of the uh, cyst or non-dependent uh, lipid layers floating in the non-dependent part. Uh, so all four of those things can give rise to benign complicated cysts. A complex cystic and solid mass is usually bioreds 4 or 5. It can be bioreds 3, again, if it's multiple and bilateral. Um, what causes a complex cystic and solid appearance? Well, mural nodules. Uh, thick septations, especially isoechoic septations, thick irregular walls, and to that I would add internal vascularity. Now what Byrads doesn't mention is that there's still a small percentage of cysts that we mistake for solid. Usually these are cysts that have echogenic fluid, so echogenic that a complicated cyst simulates a fibroadenoma. Now, why do we worry about cysts? Well, because these echoes inside of non-simple cysts could be caused by papilloma or carcinoma. But what is it usually? Protein globs, cholesterol crystals, flat fat globules, white blood cells, red blood cells, epithelial cells, foamy macrophages, individual apricot metaplastic cells, or PAM, papillary apricot metaplastic cells. And this is what it is in the vast majority of cases. Now, a pathologist can describe all these things on the left. And what the pathologist doesn't do is he doesn't get brain damage from all of this. <laughs> he sees all these things inside the cysts, but in his impression he says benign fibrocystic change. So what I want to talk about in the rest of this talk 
is how we as radiologists can do a better job of distinguishing the benign things on the left from the red things on the right, uh, suspicious things on the right. Now, this is a nice picture from a textbook on benign breast disease by Hughes and Mansell. And you can see that these are fluids drawn from benign breast cysts. And you can see that they vary greatly in color. What am I going to do? I'm going to make it grayscale and video invert them. And now you can see that they also vary greatly in opacity. Now this can be very instructive because let's just say that the two cysts on the right are simple cysts. They have about mid-level opacity. Well, we have two cysts, the second and third from the left, that have higher opacity. That means there has to be something inside the fluid causing it to be more opaque. What is that? Proteinaceous debris. We also have two of these fluids that are less dense than a simple cyst. What does that mean? It means that there has to be something in the fluid other than just water. And what would be less dense than water? Fat. So, what we're seeing here is that echoes inside of cyst fluid can be caused by proteinaceous debris or fat. Now, every cyst starts with some fat or some protein in it. But in general, the amount of protein and the percentage of fat is so low that we don't see any echoes. Here's a simple cyst. Here it is on a six-month follow-up, five-month follow-up. It still looks like a simple cyst. It's completely anechoic. But at 12 months, it's a little smaller, and now it's developed some echoes. Why is this? If you've ever followed cysts, and we weren't following this cyst, we were following this patient for a fibroadenoma, but just happened to have follow-up uh, pictures of a benign cyst. About 80% of cysts are acute and resolve spontaneously, but about 20% become chronic. Now, in a chronic cyst that doesn't go away right away, what can happen is the water component of the cyst contents can be resorbed through the cyst wall over time. And so, if you've ever followed any of these complicated cysts, you know over time they tend to become smaller and more echogenic. This is because of resorption of water. But the, whatever protein or fat contents are inside the cyst can't be resorbed through the wall. So over time, these chronic cysts tend to concentrate the fat and or uh, proteinaceous uh, contents and become more echogenic. The fluid tends to become more echogenic. So, these are pictures of cysts that every pathologist in the world will just call benign fibrocystic change. These are the video inverted grayscale images of those cysts. And these are the ultrasound pictures that correspond. We can now see quite clearly why appearances are what they are. So is there some proteinaceous debris on this simple cyst on the left? Yes. But why don't we see it on ultrasound? because the proteinaceous contents aren't dense enough or aren't concentrated enough to create echoes. Notice that we have a very thin echogenic wall. Second from the left, we have a complicated cyst caused by proteinaceous debris. Notice that the debris is more concentrated uh, and higher percentage than on the left. And so we get a diffuse low level echogenicity within the cyst, but we still have a thin echogenic wall. Now, the third from the left is also complicated, but has a layer of apricot metaplastic cells, which is thicker, and it will appear isoechoic. So you should have a slightly thicker, less echogenic wall, and the fat contents within the cyst are also going to create echoes. So we have diffuse low-level echoes, and we have a slightly thicker, uh, slightly less echogenic wall uh, than we uh, have for the proteinaceous debris. Now, on the right, is papillar apricot metaplasia. So this is causing a regular thickening of the wall and it's causing fat inside the cyst. So we have echogenic fluid, but we have irregular echogenic thickening of the cyst wall. So what this is showing is that, you know, we have a simple cyst on the left, complicated cyst in the middle, and because there's echogenic fluid, uh, we could call the right cyst complicated, but because it has a regular thickening of the wall, it could also be considered complex cystic and solid. Now, any time we have a mixture of reassuring and less reassuring findings on ultrasound, we classify by the more suspicious findings. So the right one would have to be considered complex cystic and solid rather than complicated. Now, 
we have to have a systematic approach because there are just so many cysts. We don't want to we don't want to biopsy any of them if we can avoid it, and we certainly don't want to put a lot of them in follow up because it'll just plug up our system. I mean, what are we trying to do? We're trying to detect cancers at a stage where they're so early that uh, minimal treatment can cure them. But what we we don't want to do is plug our system with a false positive. So uh, I mentioned that part of the reason we're seeing more complicated uh, cysts than we used to, non-simple cysts than we used to, is because we've taken our scan parameters beyond their limits. We've taken the frequency off so high, the dynamic range so wide, and the, and the bandwidth so wide that we're creating diffuse low-level echoes. Um, the other thing we can do is make sure that we're focusing right, because if you don't have your focal zones at the right spot, even if you have a high quality machine, your beam is going to be a little wider and you're not going to be able to resolve these microcysts. You're going to volume average black microcysts with white fibrous tissue and make it look like solid gray stuff in the, in the center of the cyst. So uh, one of the ways that we can avoid creating artificial non simple cysts is by using harmonics and spatial compounding and also carefully moving our focal zones around to make sure uh, what we're looking at is um, in focus. If we don't use harmonics or compounding, we probably have to scan at a lower dynamic range. Uh, you know, normally current top-of-the-line machines, you can scan somewhere between 70 and 105 decibels dynamic range. But if you're not using harmonics and spatial compounding, you're probably going to be stuck around 50 decibels because you're going to have too many false positives otherwise. Now, on the left is a is a complicated cyst with a fat fluid level. And notice that on the right with harmonics, a lot of those artifactual echoes are cleared out. Now, here on the left, I have fundamental jimmy. On the right, I have harmonics. And notice that in this case, I have proteinaceous debris. Uh, within the cyst, and because it's real stuff within the cyst, harmonics actually makes it uh, more echogenic. So, when the internal echoes are artifactual, harmonics tends to decrease the echoes. But when the internal echoes are real, say by caused by proteinaceous or fatty debris, harmonics tends to increase. So, what we get in summary with harmonics is a better ability to distinguish real from artifactual internal echoes. Uh, and we get a similar effect from spatial compounding. And they achieve this effect in different ways. So I'm a big believer in scanning with both spatial compounding and harmonics on. Now, I want to reassure you that the general rules of uh, non-simple cysts are very reassuring. The, the majority of non-simple uh, breast cysts lie within the spectrum of fibrocystic change. Malignant cysts are relatively infrequent. The unusual malignant breast cyst usually has the appearance of a solid nodule with liquefactive or hemorrhagic central necrosis, and it's really only in the rarest of circumstances do we see a, a malignant breast cyst that I would consider to be tricky. Now, these are populational rules. <laughs> so in individual cases, even though the populational rules are very reassuring, you kind of have to have a systematic way of evaluating these things. I mean, especially if you scan doctors' wives or nurses or doctors themselves, they always seem to be the exception to the rule. Uh, so we, we have to have a systematic way of evaluating it. Now, we also have to have a reference standard that we can use when we're trying to develop uh, an algorithm for dealing with these. And the problem is that the reference standard for non-simple breast cysts is not as good as the reference standard for solid masses. I mean, solid masses, we do core biopsy or surgical biopsy with histology. With non-simple breast cysts, the traditional way of following them was either aspiration with fluid cytology or short interval follow-up. Well, those tended to be poor reference standards because there's too many false positives and false negatives uh, with uh, fluid cytology. And if you use follow-up, a lot of these cysts go away, and a lot of people don't even bother to come back, so follow-up tends not to be very good. So the truth of the matter is we didn't really, we weren't really, and even surgery wasn't necessarily the best reference standard because invariably, either at surgery or in pathology, the dominant palpable and or mammographically visible cyst was ruptured. And then 
was misinterpreted by the pathologist as a background fibrocystic process rather than the cause uh, for the uh, biopsy or, or histology or surgery. Uh, so basically, DVAB, uh, that we were able to develop a meaningful uh, algorithm uh, for these cysts. And the full algorithm that we use for cysts that aren't simple is pretty much the same thing we use for mammography and solid breast nodules. I look for suspicious findings first. If I don't find suspicious findings, then I try to find definitively benign findings that are BIREDS2. And if I can't find BIREDS2, then I try to call it BIREDS3 so that I don't have to biopsy it, but I, I could do follow-up on it. But if I can't make it BIREDS2 or 3, then I have to consider the whole thing suspicious and I have to biopsy it. And really, again, we're not reinventing the wheel. This is exactly how I deal with mammograms and, and solid breast masses. So, when we talk about looking for things that are suspicious, BIREDS 4 or more, these are basically the things that in BIREDS Edition 5 are, are things that make a cyst classifiable as complex cystic and solid mass rather than complicated. That includes mural nodules, irregular wall thickening, thick isoechoic internal septations, and internal vascularity. And for that, I would add certain complex clustered microcysts because not all microcysts appear simple. Some appear to be complex. So let's talk about the septations. These are thin hyperechoic septations. They aren't, they aren't suspicious. Those are BIREDS too. This is benign fibrocystic change. And what are we actually seeing here? We're seeing a thin, approximately one millimeter thick or 500 micron thick ultrasound tomographic slice through a single cystically dilated TDLU. And what do I see on this image? Three cystically dilated asini within that TDLU. And what are the thin hypercoacceptations? They are simply the unruptured walls of asini. So in this particular tomographic slice, I'm three, seeing three cystically dilated asini with the septations representing unruptured asinar walls. This, on the other hand, is a thick isocoacceptation caused by papillary carcinoma. So this is suspicious. Uh, the thick isocoacceptation is suspicious. The thin hypercoacceptations are not suspicious. Now, if I take this beautiful Laszlo picture, video invert it into grayscale, you can see that I have a single cystically dilated TDLU with one, two, three, four residual cystically dilated asini. You can clearly see that these hypercoacceptations do indeed correspond to the unruptured walls between different cystically dilated asini. Now, if we get an irregular wall thickening or mural nodule, is that complex cystic and solid? Yes. Does it mean it's papilloma carcinoma? No. Papillary apricot metaplasia, which is simply part of the benign fibrocystic spectrum, can easily cause uh, irregular wall thickening or mural nodule. So if we look at the chicken versus egg argument, the question is what came first, the mural nodule or the cyst? And I think in most cases, whatever's causing the irregular wall thickening or mural nodule came first, and then by a combination of secreting fluid and obstructing the duct, secondarily created the cyst. That means that the answer as to whether this is apricot metaplasia causing this complex cystic and solid appearance, or whether it's a papilloma or carcinoma, uh, the answer lies at the point of attachment of the mural nodule uh, or irregular wall thickening to the wall. And so what you'll see if it's a true papillary lesion like papilloma or carcinoma, the thin echogenic capsule will not be present at the point of attachment. And there may be irregularity or extension of the papillary lesion, whether it's benign or malignant, into the duct, usually toward the nipple. So we can see this in real life. Here's a mural nodule. We can see a beautiful, thin, echogenic capsule almost all the way around it. But at the point where this thing arose, the capsule is absent, and it's growing up the duct toward the nipple. So the answer on this mural nodule lies only at this point where the capsule is absent and where it's growing up the duct. This is clearly not apricot metaplasia. This is clearly a papilloma or a, a papillary carcinoma, uh, because there should be a, a, an intact thin echogenic wall, and the shape should be round or oval, not keyhole shape. So this is a keyhole shape. So 
When we look at this point of attachment, we don't want to see angles. Angular is suspicious. We don't want to see loss of the capsule. We want a capsule to be present. The loss of a capsule is suspicious. We want an oval or circular shape. We don't want a protrusion into ducts that would create a keyhole shape. And we don't want to see any internal vascularity. Apricot metaplasia, no matter how vascular, virtually never incites uh, neovascularity. So, on the left is a reassuring complex cystic and solid mass caused by apricot metaplasia. The apricot metaplasia is filling about 80% of the cyst, but it's oval shaped, and all along the point of attachment, there's a, an intact thin echogenic capsule. On the right is a hemorrhagic papilloma, and what we can see is that the capsule is absent along the point of attachment on the right side, and that there's extension into a couple ducts that are creating some angles and irregularity. So the left is reassuring, caused by apricot metaplasia. On the right is suspicious, caused by a papilloma. Okay, shape. Left is reassuring, oval shape. Again, apricot metaplasia filling about two-thirds of the cyst, but notice the beautiful thin echogenic capsule all along the point of attachment. This is very typical of benign uh, apricot metaplasia. This is about a similar sized complex cystic and solid mass, but we have an absent uh, echogenic capsule along the right side where it's attached. We can clearly see that it's a keyhole shape. It's extending out uh, of the oval shape or round shape and growing into a duct. And when we see that in pathology, we can see the same thing. Here we have an oval shaped cyst, but where the papilloma is attached, the thin capsule is absent and it's growing out into a duct. So the answer really lies only at the point of attachment. Why? Well, let's take away all these lines and bring pathology back. All along the internal surface that's surrounded by fluid, benign and malignant lesions have exactly the same shape and surface characteristics. Why is that? What determines shape and surface characteristics? Two things. Number one is the resistance of the surrounding tissue to growth of the lesion. And number two is the aggressiveness of growth. But when you're surrounded by fluid, there's zero resistance to growth in any direction. And so benign and malignant lesions grow exactly the same inside a fluid. So you learn nothing by evaluating the fluid surfaces of this mass. The only place you can get any diagnostic information is the point of origin or the point of attachment to the wall. So here's an eccentric wall thickening. There's an absent capsule along the left side. So that's suspicious. And the key thing I want you to uh, look at here is this is actually intracystic grade 3 DCIS. Notice how extensive the component is outside the cyst. So in many instances, what I'm telling you here is in many instances, the answer is not inside the cyst, but outside the cyst and the surrounding tissues. So the amount of DCIS that's outside this cyst is much larger than the amount of DCIS inside the cyst. And notice that the classical histology of, of grade 3 DCIS is present. These are microlobulations, and inside microlobulation is a calcication. Where does that occur? In the necrosis, in the center of the lumen. What is each of those microlobules? It's a single grossly enlarged duct filled with DCIS, central necrosis, and calcifications within the central necrosis. Another case, similar. Tiny neural nodule, but I have an absent thin echogenic capsule along the left side where it's attached. And if I look carefully, I can see several enlarged ducts in the surrounding tissue. So again, intracystic DCIS, the answer is not necessarily inside the cyst, but in the grossly enlarged ducts and or microlobulations in the surrounding tissue. Now, apricot metaplasia, unless it develops on a pre-existing papilloma, which it can, but apricot metaplasia alone is only two cells wide. It gets all of its nutrients and gets rid of its all, all of its wastes simply by passive diffusion through the fluid. It does not develop a vascular stalk. On the other hand, intracystic papilloma and intracystic carcinoma are amongst the most vascular things in the breast. So it's often very easy to demonstrate internal vascularity within a papilloma and or carcinoma. So here's a papilloma. You can see that it has a vascular stalk that's branching. 
And this is apric and metaplasia filling a larger percentage of the cyst than is the smaller papilloma on the right, but absolutely no demonstrable flow. Now, what can I say about this? Well, if you see internal vascularity within a mirror or a thick septation, that makes it suspicious. Biorads 4, you have to biopsy it. It could be papilloma, it could be carcinoma, you can't really tell, but it's not just apric metaplasia. So a positive Doppler is exceedingly helpful. A negative Doppler, not as useful. Why? Because papillomas often undergo uh, spontaneous uh, uh, infarction and hyalinization. So if you've got an infarcted hyalinized papilloma, it won't show a vascular stalk. Now, in this case, I put the patient on her side for 10 minutes or 5 minutes. Uh, I, I put her upright with a longitudinal view for 5 minutes, and this did not shift. Occasionally, a fat food level can simulate a, an eccentric wall thickening or mural nodule. And so there are a couple ways that we can solve that that I'll talk about more later. Now let's talk about clustered microcysts. Simple clustered microcysts are by reds too. They're benign. They're just part of the fibrocystic spectrum. They're caused by apric and metaplasia. When we have complex cystic and solid microcysts, then we have a problem because we have to differential diagnosis of micropapillary DAV or uh, DCIS versus papillary apic metaplasia. So these are beautiful pictures of uh, from Laszlo to our uh, micropapillary on the left, apic metaplasia on the right. What am I going to do? I'm going to make them grayscale, video and vertum. So white is black, black is white. And you can say they look fairly similar. And now here's the ultrasounds. Whew. That's not very reassuring. They look very, very similar. So, complex clustered microcysts can be a diagnostic problem for us. What we have to take some comfort in is that more than 99 out of 100 of these complex clustered microcysts are going to be apric and metaplasia. Less than 1 out of 100 are going to be papillary, micropapillary DCIS. Now, this patient presented with a palpable lump. These were palpable. Uh, and so, on this exam, it was 14 millimeters. It was called by REDS 3, and she was asked to come back in six months. Well, seven weeks later, she thought it was enlarging, and sure enough, it had gone enlarged from 14 to 33 millimeters. Now, what did we do wrong on the first exam? We didn't put Doppler on. At 10 weeks, she came back for uh, surgery, and it had increased to 50 millimeters. This is micropapillary DCIS. What we did wrong on the first exam is that we never turned on Doppler. This was the second exam when I saw her. I put on the Doppler, and you can see how tremendously vascular this is. Remember, the differential is just two things, papillary apic and metaplasia versus micropapillary grade 3 DCIS. That's one of the most vascular lesions in the breast. If I see internal vascularity like this, it's not apic and metaplasia. This is going to be very suspicious. And so had we turned on Doppler the first time, we could have avoided that false negative. Now, one thing I have to caution you about is that the transducers firm, the breast, uh, the chest walls firm, the cysts are soft. So if you use too much scan pressure, you will, uh, you can create false negatives by shutting the tumor vessels off. The tumor vessels don't have muscular muscles or elastic, and they're easy to compress. So here, I'm just letting the weight of my arm rest on the transducer, and I'm getting a false negative. On the right, I'm consciously lifting up on the probe so that it, I'm barely touching the skin. In fact, you can see there's an air bubble here. I'm touching so lightly that I'm starting to lose contact, but you can see how tremendously vascular this is. So if you're going to use Doppler and you want to minimize false negatives, you have to use very light scan technique. And I think the literature is somewhat unfair in that it hasn't emphasized this enough. Now, once you decide that this is a complex cystic and solid mass and that you feel that it's suspicious for a papilloma carcinoma, I don't think cyst aspiration and cytology is the right thing to do. In fact, I'll tell you for sure it's not the right thing to do. I also don't think an 18-gauge core biopsy or even a 14-gauge core biopsy is the right thing to do. I think for complex cystic and solid masses, you need to do histology, and the best way to do that is vacuum and take the whole thing out and ask the pathologist to serial section the entire specimen. So here's a complex cystic and solid uh, mass we considered suspicious. Here's the vacuum probe underneath it. You can see where the aperture is by the ring down artifact. 
And then we take everything out till we get to the front wall of the cyst. Then we always deploy a marker because if there's um, uh, atypia or malignancy, we're going to have to get back and excise it. And it, it can be hard to find that area if you don't leave a marker behind. Now, there's one other thing that we might put a needle in a cyst for other than papilloma carcinoma, and that's uh, an infected cyst. So what are the signs of inflammation or infection? Uh, there are three. Uniform isochoic quote-unquote wall thickening, which I'll show you is really pericystic. A debris level, which is pus. And hyperemia of the cyst wall. Again, it's really pericystic hyperemia. Usually we see all three of those things together. So on the right is a simple cyst with a thin hyperechoic wall. Nothing suspicious there. But on the left, we have a debris level, which is layered pus, and uniform isochoic wall thickening, which again is really pericystic, and we found in most cases represents foamy macrophages and or lymphocytes or plasma cells. Uh, on the right, again, with Doppler, we get typically no flow in a benign cyst wall, but we have hyperemia in the pericystic tissues in an acutely inflamed cyst. Now, Obviously, we can get flow in the wall of a malignant nodule. But one thing I found is that in a malignant nodule, the blood vessels are simply passing through the wall to supply the intracystic papillary lesion. And therefore, the vessels tend to be oriented perpendicular to the cyst wall if it's a papilloma or carcinoma. Whereas, when it's an inflamed cyst, the vascularity is parallel to the cyst wall and usually outside the cyst in the pericystic tissues. So the orientation of the vessels can be helpful in distinguishing an inflamed cyst from uh, a malignant cyst. Now this is that simple cyst I showed you earlier at, at, at baseline, anechoic, five months, anechoic. It developed echoes at seven months. Why? Again, because fluid was resorbed and the, pro and the fatty contents became concentrated. But then uh, at 24 months, she came in with tenderness, and we can see that there's a debris level, which is pus, and there's uniform isochoic wall thickening, and there's hyperemia with the vessels parallel to the wall. So what happened here is that the fat became concentrated, and the fat is very inflammatory. Any sort of tear or rent of the epithelium lining the cyst wall can allow this inflammatory lipid content to come in contact with the surrounding tissues and cause acute inflammation. So this is actually very common. Now, when you aspirate these cysts, they aspirate completely, but the pericystic inflammation persists. So you can see this little white line represents the two walls of the cyst completely opposed. I've taken every drop of fluid out of this, but what I have is residual pericystic wall thickening. It really represents two layers of closely opposed uh, apricot metaplasia. So when you aspirate completely an inflamed cyst, expect to see the residual thickened quote-unquote wall or pericystic inflammation. I followed about a hundred of these and they go away in about two weeks so I don't bother to follow them anymore. I just expect when I get pus out of a cyst that I'm going to uh, have this residual wall thickening at the end. Now sometimes you'll get a cyst that's not acutely inflamed that has a uniform isochoic wall thickening. It's indistinguishable from an acutely inflamed cyst for the very simple reason that it represents the healed phase of an acutely inflamed cyst. So when an acutely inflamed cyst heals, it heals with fibrosis. So when it's acutely inflamed, foamy macrophages or lymphocytes or plasma cells in the pericystic area create the appearance of isochoic wall thickening. But when it heals, it's the fibrosis that creates it. And of course, these cysts won't be tender when they're no longer inflamed. If they're just thick-walled fibrotic cysts, they won't be tender and they won't have any hyperemia. Now the debris level that we see represents pus, and pus can be very viscous. So if you want to see if it shifts, you can put them on their side while you're looking transversely, or put them upright while you're scanning longitudinally, and they will shift. But it's not instantaneous. The debris is so thick and viscous that it can take five minutes to shift. So you can see here, when I'm scanning transversely, supine, the pus is layered posteriorly, but when I put it on our left side, even at two minutes, it's just beginning to shift. Three minutes a little more. It isn't until five minutes that it's fully shifted to the left side of the cyst. That's somewhat of a problem. And there's a shortcut we can use. So here's a case of an inflamed cyst with tumefactive pus. 
but it look it's so tumefactive it looks like a mural nodule. So what can I do? I could put her on her side and wait five or ten minutes for this to shift. But I can do fremitus. So if I put in power Doppler with PRF of a thousand, have the patient hum, it'll create orange artifact or yellow artifact in the breast. Normal breast tissues will vibrate. Now, if this were attached to the cyst wall, like a mural nodule, like a papilloma carcinoma, it would turn orange as well. The fact that this does not turn orange on fremitus means that it's not attached, and this proves conclusively this is just tumefactive pus. So, what do I gain by doing this? I can save five minutes. I don't have to wait five or ten minutes for this gooey, sticky pus to shift. Now, in that particular case, I had to wait 10 minutes for this to shift. So, in this particular case, simply turn on power Doppler Fremitus saved me uh, 10 minutes. Would have saved me 10 minutes. Now, when you aspirate these inflamed cysts, you either get pus or bloody pus. If I just get pain pus, I don't send it for cytology or flow cytometry because I'm not worried about papilloma carcinoma. All I want to know is it infected or just bland inflammation. So all I need is a gram stain and a culture on that. If I get bloody pus, on the other hand, then I feel obligated to send it for cytology and flow cytometry. So what's the point here? Well, the point is I showed you all the vascularity in the pericystic tissues. If you're going to aspirate a cyst uh, that you think is inflamed, put on color Doppler, find the vessels, find a root in that avoids the vessels so that you can get plain pus and not bloody pus. Now, what percentage of these inflamed cysts is actually infected? Only a small percentage. Most of this is bland inflammation. What causes the bland inflammation? The lipid contents in the cysts. Lipid is very inflammatory and again, only a tiny rent or tear in the epithelium can lead to severe inflammation. So the vast majority of these inflamed cysts are not infected. What do I do? Yeah, I, I cover them with dicloxacillin. Usually yeah, these spontaneous outpatient infected cysts are caused by staph. And while I'm waiting for the 72-hour culture, I give them a three-day prescription of Diclox. And if it's, if it's positive, the culture is positive, then I can extend their um, antibiotics for seven, you know, to seven or ten days. But if it's negative, I'm already done. So that's kind of my approach to these things. Now, once we've decided a cyst is not suspicious for tumor and it's not inflamed, then we can look for definitively benign findings. And those things are usually things that, you know, in the ACR BIREDS 5th edition, are simply things that make it a complicated cyst. So, these are scintillating echoes. They're being moved simply by the energy of the ultrasound beam. Now, what I had to do to make these move, in this case, was I had to turn up the transmit power on the machine. Basic ultrasound machines always boot up at low transmit power, as low as reasonably acceptable transmit power, to minimize whatever possible adverse effects ultrasound might have. So to make these move with grayscale, in some cases you may have to manually turn up the power. A simpler thing to do is simply turn on color or power Doppler, which supplies about 10 times the power of grayscale ultrasound. So I don't bother anymore turning up the transmit power. I just put on uh, color or power Doppler. Notice that the echoes are moving faster here than they were with uh, grayscale ultrasound. So the fact that they're moving faster also shows you that Doppler has more power. Now here, I'm scanning with an open box, and you can see it's moving echoes, so these are scintillating echoes, but notice what happens when I narrow the box. See how much faster they're moving? What's the significance of that? Well, the viscosity of fluid in the cyst can vary greatly. So for the least viscous fluid, just grayscale ultrasound, even at low power settings, may make them move. As the fluid gets more viscous, an open color box may make them move. As fluid gets even more viscous, they may not move with an open color box. You may have to narrow the color box to make them move. And the last thing that supplies even more energy than Doppler is shear wave elastography. So uh, this machine is generating about three shear waves a second. So you can see that the movement appears jerky. Uh, but two things about this shear wave are telling me that this is just echogenic fluid and not a, a, a hypoechoic solid mass. Number one is I can see the echoes being moved, the scintillating echoes. Um, and number two, it's not transmitting shear waves. No matter how viscous fluid is, it won't transmit shear waves. So, so basically, grayscale will move uh, echoes. It'll create scintillating echoes in very non-viscous fluid. 
uh, open color box in mildly viscous fluid, narrow color box in more viscous fluid, and uh, probably the best thing to do is shear wave because it'll move the most viscous fluid and give you the best distinction of uh, solid versus complicated cysts with echogenic uh, fluid. Now when you aspirate these complicated cysts with internal echoes, they aspirate completely. And you don't see anything on flow cytometry and, uh, and uh, cytology that's suspicious. But if you look under polarized light, you'll see these birefringent cholesterol crystals. So I believe that these scintillating echoes are simply cholesterol crystals. Uh, you know, they're cr crystallized fat, essentially. And they're just benign. They're virids, too. As debris, proteinaceous debris, can layer in the non-dependent part of the cyst, a lipid layer can layer in the non-dependent part of the cyst. So protein layers posteriorly in the dependent part, fat layers anteriorly in the non-dependent part. And just like you can make proteinaceous debris move by changing patient position, you can make fat move by changing patient position. So here on the left, I'm scanning supine. The fat is layered anteriorly. Uh, when I put the patient upright, it moves to the craniate end of the cyst. So you can see a 90 degree shift in the degree in the orientation of the fat fluid level. Now these aspirate completely just like complicated cysts and in general these these are virids too. You don't need to aspirate them if you can definitively prove it's just a fat fluid level. Interestingly immediately after aspiration I don't see a little white lipid layer here because the fat has become emulsified passing through the needle. So tiny micro droplets are evenly dispersed through the fluid but if I leave this upright on the desk for a few minutes a white fat layer will form uh, on top. Now, we call this an acorn cyst because it looks like the cap on an acorn. So here's an acorn cyst that's not caused by uh, a fat fluid level. It's actually caused by papillar apricot metaplasia. And I know that because even after 10 minutes I can't get it to shift. If this were a fat fluid level, when I put her supine, the interface between the fat and the fluid would have shifted horizontally with the fat being anteriorly and the fluid being posteriorly. Now, the problem with causing, you know, with, with uh, getting fat fluid levels to shift is that like proteinaceous debris, it can take a long time for the shift to occur. So here I'm showing you a longitudinal view of a complicated cyst with a fat fluid level filled about 70% with fat. And when I put her supine, Immediately, nothing happens. At one minute, it's only beginning to shift. At two minutes, a little more. At three minutes, a little more. And it isn't until five minutes that it shifted. Is this a problem? Way big a problem. Why? Because we don't see that many cysts with fluid debris levels, but we see thousands and thousands of fat fluid levels. Why? Because apricot cells, which create cysts, excrete fat into the fluid. So a large percentage of benign fibrocystic cysts have fat in them. In many cases the fat's not concentrated enough to see, but when it does become concentrated enough to see, if the patient lies still or is in the same position for a long enough time, the fat will come out of solution and layer. So in somebody with fe severe fibrocystic change, it wouldn't be unusual to see somebody with five of these on each side. And if you have to wait five minutes for each of these five cysts, uh, you're talking 50 minutes just to prove that these are all fat fluid levels. So there has to be a shortcut. So is there a shortcut that can prevent us from waiting five minutes? There are two shortcuts. Shortcut number one is to look at the shape of the interface between the echogenic fat and the clear fluid. And if it's a fat fluid level, the shape is sigmoid shaped or S shaped, convex posteriorly, concave anteriorly. That's the classical shape of a fat fluid level in the process of shifting from one non-dependent position to another as the patient changes position. This is important for sonographers because if they're efficient, the patient is upright in the waiting room. Or they put her on the table and if they have um, work lists so they can pull up the patient's information very quickly, they may well have scanned the patient sooner than five minutes. So sonographers are frequently going to see this sigmoid shape. Now, there's a second shortcut. And the second shortcut is simply to use Fremitus. So I have two acorn cysts side by side. Remember I told you acorn cysts can be caused by apricot metaplasia, papillary apricot metaplasia, 
or by a fat fluid level. Remember that a fat fluid level is not attached, so it won't transmit fremitus. But apricot metaplasia is attached, so it will. So when I look at the fremitus, I can see that this supposedly thickened wall is not transmitting fremitus, proving it's not attached, proving that it's a fat, a, a lipid layer. On the other hand, the one on the right is clearly transmitting fremitus, showing clearly that this is attached. I mean, this is not just a, fat, a lipid layer. It could be papillary apicot metaplasia, it could be papilloma, it could be carcinoma. But what this is showing me clearly in just a few seconds without waiting five minutes is that one of these is a complicated cyst that's BIREDS2 and one of these is a complex cyst that's BIREDS3, 4, or 5 depending on our other evaluations that we do. Now this shows shear wave. Again, shear waves will not transmit um, through fluid no matter how viscous. So if we get black in the center we know that it's a complicated cyst, not solid. With a slight caveat, you can get liquefactive or hemorrhagic necrosis in, say, a grade 3 triple negative cancer, and you might get black in the center of the cyst there. So the other caveat I would give you is that shear wave doesn't seem to work. Neither shear wave nor strain elastography seems to work very well with cysts smaller than a centimeter. And in many cases, our, our dilemma is that we're trying to solve this problem in smaller than one centimeter cysts. So there are some limitations to, to shear wave. Now, milk of calcium is a complicated cyst. It's just debris within the cyst, but they're just uh, samomatous calcifications. Individually, these are too small to resolve with ultrasound. So what we see is a cluster of dozens of tiny samomatous calculi, and we can make them shift into it, you know, just like we do on mammography. This is actually the ultrasound version of a teacup. So here we see a teacup on a beautiful Tabar 3D slide. Here we're showing this cluster of semomus calcification shifting from the posterior wall while the patient is supine to the inferior wall when she's upright in a longitudinal view. Now, there's another cause of calcifications of benign cysts called calcium oxalate crystals or wetolites. Now they're larger, they're kind of like tiny gallstones. And again, we can make those shift. So here I've, I'm scanning transversely with the patient supine. I see a couple of calculi on the posterior wall of the cyst. And now I've turned around her left side and they've, uh, in the transverse view, they've fallen over to the left side in the left lateral decubitus position. And we can actually show that in real time. So here I'm just showing these calcium oxalate crystals falling down the back wall as I uh, rotate the patient from her back to her left side while I'm scanning transversely. Now, we can get clusters of punctate or amorphous calcifications uh, in microcysts where we can't see classical teacups. And they're suspicious mammographically, but on ultrasound we can actually show clustered microcysts with dependent calcifications in the posterior wall of each of the microcysts. And sometimes the best way to show that is a video suite. So, mammography can show more numerous and smaller calcifications than can ultrasound, but ultrasound can sometimes be more definitively benign. Cysts that occur in the skin are sebaceous cysts or epidermal inclusion cysts. They can lie entirely within the skin. They can lie mostly subcutaneous, but we can see a claw of skin wrapping around them. Or they can be entirely subcutaneous, but we can see the gland neck uh, along the uh, hair follicle, sometimes with a white head or a black head, obstructing it. Notice that in all of these, I've got a little gel standoff. This is an ultimate near-field problem. Um, even with a matrix array probe, it can be difficult to clearly demonstrate whether these are subcutaneous or of skin origin, and especially the case where it's mostly subcutaneous and you need to see the gland neck to know that it's a sebaceous cyst. Uh, it can be helpful to use gel standoff. Notice that I've got a thicker gel standoff on the left than the right because these hair follicles uh, course obliquely through the skin, so I need to create an angle nearly 90 degrees, as close to 90 degrees to this as possible, and that usually requires some healing and towing of the probe with a gel standoff, but these are definitively benign. Now, I mentioned that about 3% of the time we can't tell whether something is cystic or solid. Um, in general, fibroadenomas are going to be slightly marcogenic, oval-shaped, and parallel, and complicated cysts with echogenic fluid are going to be rounder, more hypochoic, and have enhanced through transmission. But you know, in any individual case, it can be impossible to tell whether something's a complicated cyst or a solid nodule. 
So there's several approaches. We can try to clear the artifact with harmonics and spatial compounding. I showed you that earlier. Uh, we can look for internal blood vessels because there's internal blood vessels. It's either an insisted papillary lesion or solid mass. We can just say, hey, what's the worst? It could be solid. And if we characterize it, it'll be Virads 3. But then we're obligated to do six month follow up. We can do elastography to try to distinguish heterogenic fluid from solid. We can attempt to aspirate it. Or we can do also I get a directional vacuum assisted biopsy. A lot of people go to attempted aspiration first thing off. I don't like that because if I can't aspirate it completely, then it obligates me to do an outside guided vacuum assisted biopsy. I per prefer to use one of the other approaches. Here I've turned on color Doppler. Could this have been a cyst? Yeah. But all this internal vascularity means it's either solid mass or an insisted papillary lesion. Um, here I'm using shear wave. This is transmitting shear waves. It's turning blue. This indicates this is solid. In this case, there's no transmission of shear waves proving that it's a cyst. Now, if you use strain elastography, depending on which machine, there are different ways to tell. On the GE machine, here I've got a trilaminar uh, blue, red, green uh, layer showing that this is fluid contained. And here on a Phillips or a Siemens, I'm getting this uh, bullseye appearance where I'm getting white in the center of a cyst that tells me that this is just a cyst and not solid. So. You have to know what type of elastography you have and which machine you have, and you have to sort of figure out how that works on your particular machine. There's not one set of rules that goes for every, every elastography machine. Now, if we assume that an indeterminate cystic versus solid lesion is solid, it's usually round or oval, uh, has a thin capsule, and enhanced through transmission. So we can usually call it BIRADS 3 or 2, depending on whether they're multiple incidental or, or single. Um, dominant palpable or mammographic. If it's a single dominant palpable or mammographic, we may call it BIRADS 3. If it's multiple bilateral, incidental, like during a screening ultrasound, we'd probably call it BIRADS 2. Now, if we try to aspirate these indeterminate cystic versus solid lesions, there are three possibilities, and I haven't found any way to predict from the grayscale ultrasound alone which of these it's going to be. It might be completely non aspiratable, it might be partially aspiratable or it might be completely aspiratable. Here's an indeterminate lesion. Is this a complicated cyst? Or is it a solid nodule? I don't know. Is it a fibroadenoma? Maybe. Is it a papilloma completely filling a cyst? Maybe. Is it a cyst completely filled with papillary epicometaplasia? Maybe. Is it a cyst filled with proteinaceous debris? Maybe. Is it a cyst filled with lipids? Maybe. Or could it even be a mixture of papillary epicometaplasia and a cyst filled with lipids. So this could be six different things. This is just proteinaceous debris, this is just fatty debris, and this is completely filled with apical metaplasia. So here's one that looks for all the world like a classical fibroadenoma. I put a needle in, I attempt to aspirate it, it aspirates completely. Now here's one that's rounder and more hypochoic. It looks like a cyst. I put a large needle in. This is an 18 gauge. Normally I would use a 20. You can see that the tip of the needle is exactly halfway between the front wall of the cyst and the back wall. I can't get anything to aspirate, even with a 30 cc syringe. Now, you know, that could be a solid mass. It could be a papilloma. It could be a fibroadenoma. It could be a triple negative cancer. Or it could just be papillary epicometaplasia completely filling a cyst. One thing I can do is try to rotate the tip of the needle up and down within the cyst because if it's a solid mass, a papilloma or carcinoma, I'm not going to be able to move the tip of that needle. It's going to stay exactly halfway between the front and back wall. So I did that. I'm rotating posteriorly as hard as I can, so hard that I'm indenting the pectoralis muscle, but the tip of that needle is exactly halfway between the front and the back wall. This is a solid mass. There's no way that this is papillary epicometaplasia. Now, in this case, I couldn't aspirate the cyst. I've rotated the tip of the needle anteriorly to the front wall of the cyst, shown by the anterior pink arrow. But now I've been able to move the tip all the way to the back. So even though I can't aspirate this because it's apical metaplasia, apical metaplasia, remember, is just two cells wide. It's not solid. It's just little gracile papillary excrescences that I can easily be torn uh, by the needle as I rock it front to front to back. So this shows that this is just apricot metaplasia. Now, when you aspirate these 
cysts with viscous fluid, I use a vacutainer system many times and I'll just change the size of the needle. If I think it's very viscous, I'll use a 30 cc syringe. But many times the fluid's too viscous to actually show up in the glass part of the tube. You have to actually look up in the cork and you'll see some green mucusy looking stuff or white foamy looking stuff. And if you smear that, you'll either get acellular debris or papillary metaplasia. So basically you can turn a failed aspiration into an FNA. Do I like FNA in the breast? No. But am I satisfied to use FNA in a failed aspiration to prove that it's just apical metaplasia? Yeah, I am. So it's kind of a fallback position for me. Now, if all that fails, we have to go to outside vacuum biopsy. And that's why aspiration is my least favorite method. I try to use one of the other methods first. And remember, if we can't classify it as bioreds 2 or 3, then we have to classify it by at least bioreds 4A, and we have to biopsy it. Well, this is why it's important to really distinguish non-simple cysts and, and to have some method of evaluating. This is a single field of view in a patient in whom every field of view in both breasts look this way. We have four different types of non-simple cysts. We have a debris level. We have indeterminate cystic versus solid in number four. We have a fat level in number three. And we have uh, acorn cyst, non-mobile, apric and metaplasia in cyst two. So this is one of the reasons we have to be willing to use multiplicity to downgrade as many of these non-simple cysts to bioreds 2 as possible. Basically, if we're doing a whole breast exam, whether it's diagnostic or screening, and we see multiple incidental, non-palpable, non-mammographically visible lesions on mammograms, we downgrade that to bioreds 2 using the rule of multiplicity. We need to be able to do the same thing with ultrasound in order to not plug up our entire breast system with a lot of benign breast cysts that don't really need further workup. So in summary, we see a larger percentage of non-simple cysts than we used to because of better resolution and, and scan parameters being exceeded. And the evaluation is complicated and that is meant to be a play on word. Uh, the reference standard was really not clear until uh, directional vacuum assisted biopsy could remove only the part that was suspicious. We did not create a new algorithm. We simply apply the same algorithm I used to mammography and solid breast nodules. We use BIRADS categories. If it's BIRADS 4, we need histology, and that means DVAB. If it's inflamed, we need aspiration and culture, but not cytology. We need also a guidance to avoid getting bloody fluid. And we have to downgrade uh, as many BIRADS 3s to BIRADS 2 for the role of multiplicity as, as is possible. Thank you.